Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blackware Intelligence Podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Before we get into the show, let me tell you a little bit about our sponsor, FTX US. FTX US, one of the largest crypto companies in the United States, is the safest, most regulated way to buy and sell Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other digital assets. With FTX, you can trade crypto with up to 85% lower fees than top competitors. There are no fixed minimum fees, no ACH transaction fees, and no withdrawal fees. FTX has also recently announced their stocks beta rolling out to U.S. customers to enable crypto, stocks, and NFT trading in one interface. This includes hundreds of U.S. exchange-listed securities, including common stocks and ETFs, and an integrated experience within the existing FTX U.S. cryptocurrency trading application. Use promo code BLOCKWARE1 or go to ftx.blockwareintelligence.com to earn free crypto on every trade over $10. Again, that's BLOCKWARE1 or go to ftx.blockwareintelligence.com to get started today. Now let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Blackware Intelligence Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest for you guys, Mr. Mark Yusko, another North Carolina native. Mark, welcome to the show. Ah, thanks for having me on the show and excited to, to finally make this happen. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't get to hang out enough. We need, to, we need to make that happen more since we're so relatively close. I know. Yeah, especially uh, my sister went to, to UNC. She just graduated, but I've been making my ways over there a fair amount, but I'll definitely have to, awesome. to make the trip up soon. It's yeah. nice that, uh, on, a, on a side note, it's nice the, uh, the weather's cooled off a little bit for anybody who, I guess, isn't in the North Carolina area. It's been like extremely hot lately. You can't even go outside for more than five minutes. So it's nice to finally get it cooled down a little bit to the mid eighties. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and, and actually mid eighties with no humidity is amazing. I'm actually headed out this afternoon to spend the morning tomorrow in, in Austin for, uh, the craziness of consensus. And, you know, I was there on Tuesday for Decentral and it was like a hundred degrees and they said it was 107 over the weekend. And that's hot. I mean, hot, hot. It was not fun. So. Yeah. That's incredible. I, and the heat index must be at like 115 or 120. It's or crazy. Something. Yeah. It's crazy. And yeah, it's slow, but it's a dry heat. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like Houston humid, but it's, it's, it's hot. It's just hot. Yeah. So on the flip side, I guess this, uh, this current, seasonal summer we've got a crypto winter going on at the same time uh, let's go ahead Absolutely. and kind of dive right in i, I first want to ask you being someone who that's who's kind of been in the space for a fairly long time i believe you got in 2018 correct uh, in like kind of the bottom of the, the bear market yep yeah we started morgan creek digital in kind of q1 2018 and you know right right in the teeth of of the bear market and and it's interesting I shouldn't say bear market, the, the crypto winner. Uh, and I differentiate between the two because market cycle, bull market, bear market, up 20, down 20. Um, but crypto winter is different. Winter is uh, uh, basically an outcropping of the cycle created by the having that's built into Bitcoin. And everybody says, oh, no, you know, that cycle is not. Yeah, the cycle is the cycle. And it is encoded. And what happens is, that having cycle creates a impetus for the price to rise, right? Think of the miners, their cost of, of electricity and machines is relatively fixed. If the, if the number of block rewards is come half, the price needs to rise or a whole bunch of those miners are going to go out of business. So, but because that price rises, it then attracts speculators. And when the speculators swamp the long-term investors, the price will deviate from fair value. You get into crypto spring and summer uh, or summer and fall, and you get the big spike up, whether that was you know, December 17 or, or November last year. And then right, gravity rules and prices start to head back down toward, toward fair value and people panic or liquidated if there's too much leverage in the system, which is kind of what happened this time. And, and that's, that's a, a long answer to your simple question. We started in 2018, right in the middle of crypto winter, uh, which was awesome because we got to invest in a bunch of companies at really low valuations. But more importantly, we got to buy the digital assets because we bought Bitcoin, Ethereum. We ended up buying Solana and the graph. 
at really low prices. And those have all done extremely well for that fund. Uh, you know, raised second fund in 2020, which was getting closer to uh, you know, a normalized market, kind of, you know, summer and spring and summer. Uh, and then, you know, this fund three that we're currently rating, you know, we raised two thirds of it in the teeth of, you know, crypto fall where people were, were crazy and prices being paid were crazy. And now we're definitely in winter. And the last thing I'll leave you with is I am concerned that everyone wants winter to be over, but it feels to me a lot like the physical summer months into the fall months of 2018, where you know Bitcoin had fallen from 20, kind of all the way down to six and just kind of bounced along 6,000. But it made this crazy pattern called a descending triangle where every bounce off six was lower. And then ultimately on November 14th, I think, or 13th, we busted through that, that 6,000 and we were at 3,200 almost instantaneously. And, and I do fear that. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you look at this pattern we're in right now where we're bouncing off 29 and each bounce is lower, that usually doesn't end well. Again, not a prediction per se, but it does make me a little nervous. I have a couple of things I want to kind of break down from everything you just said. The first is just touching on the cycle and broadly, you know, it seems like over time you've kind of got this diminishing return effect from cycle to cycle, especially when we look at the 2017 compared to yep. the last two years. Uh, although I guess you can make the argument that you did see that blow off top just in some of those lower cap coins like a Solana or like an Avalanche, right? So how do you kind of think through the cycles moving forward, A, from kind of a return standpoint, and then B, do you think as the you know asset class gets more paired with, I guess, broader macro, do you think it moves away from these kind of having cycles and then just kind of trades with what's in line with what's going on in broader markets? Or just, I guess, how do you kind of think through that whole dynamic? Yeah, look, I, I think there's, there is a logic to the, the up move of the cycle being smaller each time. That's right? the law of large numbers. In the you know, 2009 to 13 run, we were a science project. Right. I mean, there was there was no there there. There was very little participation, very little volume, a lot of manipulation. And in particular, that that big price spike in hindsight, most of it was manipulation. So it wasn't real. So when now people look back at that and say, oh, well, we should go up 40 X. Well, no, I mean, you can't manipulate a six hundred billion dollar asset the way you could manipulate a six billion dollar asset. Just can't do it. So then you go to the 2017 cycle and it was a 20 X move and everybody's like, Oh, well, we should at least go up that high in the, in the 17, in the uh, 2021 move. I'm like, well, no, again, half the size of the market. And so there's, there's a, a natural logic to me that if, if we go from, you know, a thousand to 20,000, Okay, that's a, a 20x move. And we go from 3,200 to you know, 70,000. That's actually coming close to that same type of move. And, and the idea that we look back to that 13 that was just price manipulation at uh, Mt. Gox, it just, just doesn't make any sense. So I, I think the cycle is going to be with us forever. And it's because of the way the having rewards work. And Bitcoin is the king, right? All these other coins, all these other projects, they're all related to the flows into and out of Bitcoin. And that cycle certainly impacted by macro factors. And, you know, we can, we can make the case right now, you and I could make a really strong case for why Bitcoin is digital gold, right? And that gold has been the perfect store of value over long periods of time relative to the dollar. But that doesn't mean that you can't go for long periods of time where it goes the wrong way, right? The money supply expanded from 2011 to 2019, but the price of gold went down. It went from 1900 to, to 1000. Why? Why? 
Well, there's all kinds of reasons. Jay Morgan spoofing the price of gold and, and all kinds of other things. But ultimately, over the long period of time, if you zoom out 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 5,000 years, for 5,000 years, an ounce of gold bought a fine person suit. <laughs> it's a perfect store of value. And if you look over a long period of time, Right. And he says, oh, but, you know, the last last six months, Bitcoin's down, money supplies up. Well, right. But zoom out, go back to two years ago. Money supply went up 50 percent. Price of Bitcoin's up a little over 50 percent. It's pretty logical. If it's digital gold and gold is supposed to be the store of value and there's money migrating from gold into this digital asset, it's going to play that role. It's also not surprising that for the first time in 13 years, the Fed is constricting the money supply. So assets that are linked to money supply, gold, digital gold, might be affected. So 100% agree there will be impacts by other factors, whether that's new capital coming in from institutions. That's one narrative that, oh, that's going to get rid of the cycle. No, it's not. Institutions are just as dumb as retail investors, right? The history is replete with examples of buying tops and selling bottoms. They are not like these disciplined all uh, funds that always just keep adding to the asset over time. They puke it out at the bottom, uh, just like everybody else. I think that's really well said. And like one of the takeaways from everything you said is like, you've got this underlying network effect that's going to continue pushing this thing higher over time. But in the short term, some of these things do have factors on the price action. How do you well, think- well, the, thing is, the thing is important and in, in, it's the difference between price and value, right? The value of any asset is determinable, right? Whether it's the value of this shirt that I bought or whether it's the value of this building I sit in, or whether it's the value of a company like Amazon, which is not really a company, it's a network, right? Amazon doesn't make stuff. They match buyers and sellers and take a cut. Now they do some logistics and other stuff. And I guess they make some knockoff products. Bottom line, they're a network. Same thing with Apple. Apple, yeah, they, they make stuff, but no, no, no. The network effect is that you and I have a phone and we text back and forth and we buy apps that network effect grows the bigger the network. So the Bitcoin network is determinable. We know how many nodes, we know how many users, we know how many wallets, we know how many transactions, we know the size of the transactions. And we can plug all this stuff into a Metcalf's law model and we can actually get a curve. And that curve can tell us the value, but people don't care about the value. People care about the price. People care about the price. Like if you and I trade 100 shares of Microsoft stock, the price that we see on our phone is the price. But if I had a million shares of Microsoft, that was not the price. You would not pay that price for a million shares. You would pay a much lower price. And if I had 100 million shares and tried to sell it, it would collapse the price. So the same thing is true with Bitcoin. If two people trade you know, 25 sats, it's not going to move the price. If people try to move a large amount, it will move the price. And what happens is, if you think about value accreting very slowly, the price follows that value until it gets high. And then speculators come in and push it higher. And then the gamblers come in and push it higher. Then the levered gamblers come in and push it higher until we reach December 2018, right? I mean, 17, where the value based on the network number was 10,000 and the price was 20. There's no question it was going to go back to 10, but worse, it always goes through fair value because people get afraid and then they sell. And we went all the way to 3,200. At 3,200, it was a screaming buy, right? I mean, I went on TV and challenged anybody, Pomp and Jason and I challenged anyone in the world. We will take Bitcoin for the next 10 years. You take the S&P, million dollar charity bet. December 6th, 2018, no one would take it, crickets. One guy actually, I won't, I won't say who, said, yeah, I'll do it. And his son was like, no, you will not. 
no upside for us. We're an asset management firm. If we win, it, it no, we're not doing this because we, we might lose. Good thing, because we would have crushed it, right? We're up 10X and the s and not. But the thing is, today, or, or go back to November. In November, the value based on that same model, 32K. And we got to 69. That was dumb, right? That is greed. That is leverage. Then it came out and we went all the way down. We hit what our 26 the other day. That's below fair value. Now, is 26 the ultimate low in this cycle? Or do we, and now we're hovering right around 30, or do we have that one more puke? which I'm afraid of, where we get to that really undervalued level where you can back up the truck. I don't know. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I've learned over the last two years is you can never like underestimate the power of reflexivity in this market, given yes. there's no, I guess, commonplace valuation model that everyone looks at. Uh, with that in mind, I also thought it was funny that you brought up the, the Metcalf's Law thing because we're actually releasing a user adoption report in about an hour here at Blockware. Nice. So I'll send you that after we get off this call. Um, how do you think through valuation? So I know you touched on this model. I don't know how much you want to share, maybe from a high level, um, that model itself. And then, you know, are there other moving averages? For example, a lot of people love- Lots the of, no, There's so the many ways to think about it. Now, moving averages are not about valuation. Moving averages are about human emotion and psychology. Now, they tend to approximate value if you use a long enough moving average, like four-year moving average, right? Sailor just tweeted this out, right? Every time we get to that four-year weekly moving average, we bounce off it. Well, then you would think, well, that must be around the same. And if you look at the shape of the curve, it looks just like a Metcalf's Law parabola. Not shocking. If the value of the network is following Metcalf's law and the participants are either paying too much or too little, which will eventually mean revert, we're gonna follow that curve. So that, that, that should work. And so in 2014, I wish I could give the guy credit, but I can't remember his name. Um, this guy published the original Metcalf's law curve. And he said, this is my estimate. And he nailed it, right? In 2014, he said on November 6th, 2017, the value of the network would hit 10,000. He was off by four days. November 10th, it hit 10,000. Okay. And that same curve went out into July of 2022 and said it would be 100,000. Okay. That was the original curve. Now, my, my, I'll call, him, I'll call him a friend. We're not buddies, but he's my friend, Tim Peterson at N Squared Crypto. He said, well, this guy's decay factor is wrong. It's, it's not high enough. And so he did a new model, which I love and the one I use, that has a, a different decay factor because every uh, parabolic curve has breakage, right? There's, there's people that come into a network and then leave. And that decay factor is real. So you, you can't just say everyone that comes into the Bitcoin network stays forever. They don't. So some come in and try it and then they leave. So his decay factor basically says, is where I get that 32, 33. It says today, right? 32, 33. And it says 100K at the end of 2024. Now, the other model that everybody uses, right? Is stock to flow. And I love plan B and, and I thought his model was great. And the idea of scarcity is beautiful. The challenge of it is, is again, it's, it's a model that's based on uh, uh, a physical trait, right? Gold scarcity or uh, you know, commodity scarcity. And we're trying to use it in a world saying, well, there's 21 million fixed supply of Bitcoin. So we know what the monetary policy is and, and we know how many days we are from the halving. And so we should be able to calculate. And there was this beautiful fit with, with some caveats that you know, I don't want to get really into because I don't want to criticize the work because I like the work, but everyone started using the model. Like in 2013, there was no stock to flow model. In 2017, there was no stock to flow model. So now everyone was looking at the, the stock to flow model saying, well, look at what happened in 2017. No, that's a back test. And every back test looks good. And so they were, they were retrofitting 
like force fitting the chart. And that's what I call chart crime. And so when everyone was looking at the same model last fall, I mean, last summer, what happened? It didn't work. I'm sorry, 21, 21. It, it said in July of 2021 was going to be 100K. And everybody was sure. And, and, you know, and everybody was wrong. And so why? Well, 69 actually in math terms is really not that different from 100. I mean, it sounds very different, but but in terms of directionality of, of the model, it's not really that different. The problem I think that, that may have changed it is the release of futures. So futures allow speculators to put downward pressure on the price of commodities. So whether it's oil futures or gold futures, we all know the gold story, right? JP Morgan last year, paid a 900, well, okay, they didn't pay. They only paid 60, but they were fined $920 million. And wait, if you're fined 920, but you only have to pay 60, well, then you're only fined 60. But the headline was they were fined $920 million, but they paid 60, but they made billions spoofing the price of gold, using futures to artificially suppress the price of gold. Because if in the old days, if I wanted to sell you a barrel of oil, I actually had to have the oil. I couldn't just promise to sell you a paper barrel of oil. I actually had to have oil. Well, futures allow people to come in and push the price down. So if you look at the release of the Bitcoin future, December 18th, 2018, 2017, that was the day of the peak. And as soon as the banks could pump the price down, they did. And then that causes the reflexivity, to your point, that pushed the price to low levels. Guess what happened this time? We got all the way up to 60 something K and everybody was all excited, went from 10K to 60K. And then Burry came out and said he was short and the market collapsed. And we went all the way down to 29. And then we rebounded all the way back to 69 by November. And everybody's like, see, the stock to flow is right. It's going to be great. And then bang, why? They approved the futures ETF instead of the spot ETF. And that was intentional, 100% intentional by the SEC being paid by, I shouldn't say paid, influenced by the banks to regulate the growth of the dis, this disruptive industry. Because what was happening is money was leaving the banking world, the fiat world. And when a bank is super levered and they lose deposits, their leverage ratios go up and they get very nervous. So as the money left into digital assets, stable coins and Bitcoin, they got freaked out. So they're like, you need to, to stop this. So by allowing the futures to exist, it allows the big banks to spoof the price down. And once that price starts to fall, the over levered speculators get liquidated. I, I tell the story and I shouldn't tell it on, on, a, on a person I know, I won't name names, who called me and said, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, well, is it BitMEX? I'm like, stop. You levered your Bitcoin and you didn't make the margin call and they seized the collateral. No, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, no, you are an idiot. You lost your Bitcoin by levering it up and not making the margin call. Now, some have said that those firms actually prey on people by promising them big returns to get them to lever up so they can seize the collateral. I'm like, oh shit, that would be theft. But I'm not going to accuse anybody of anything. So that's a long answer to your, your, your point, but the cycle is driven by greed and fear. Greed and fear is reflexive, as you said. And if anyone hasn't read Soros's book on, on reflexivity, you, you need to. And it, it's a philosophy book. And, and don't read the first one because it's impossible to read. Read his second one that is still hard to read, but it's not about the first book. I mean, I literally had to put down because it's just gobbledygook. The second one is actually really good. Uh, and talks about. In fact, I actually wrote a paper where I interpreted that book. If anyone cares, you can just Google Morgan Creek uh, quarterly letters on Soros. Um, but ultimately, price does not have to reflect value. It can deviate from value above or below for a meaningful period of time. That's one thing. Two, reflexivity is real. You know, a body in motion will stay in motion until an equal and opposite force is applied. 
And so once things start going up, they'll go up longer than you think. And once they start going down, they'll go down longer than you think. And, and ultimately, the big thing for me is we're in the then they fight you stage. So Gandhi famously said, although he didn't say it, it was some other guy who I should give credit to, but I can't remember his name, that said, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I modified it to say, look, 2009 to 15, first they ignore you. Bitcoin, a bunch of nerds, geeks, drug dealers, bad guys, whatever. Ignore you. 16 to 21, then they laugh at you. Ah, look at those nerds and geeks and stupid, you know, just playing with this magic internet money. Ridiculous. 2022 to 2027, then they fight you. And this fight is going to be tough. It's going to be real. And it's just getting started, right? The stablecoin stuff, you know, after the, the Luna debacle, it is not a coincidence, Will, not a coincidence that the day after the Luna debacle, Yellen's up talking about regulating stable coins. Not a, not a coincidence. And the people who said that they didn't cause it, I'm going to call bullshit on that. Me think they doth protest too much. So all of this comes back to in the then they fight you phase. It's going to be probably lower for longer. It's going to be tougher for longer. And But the thing is, we've already won. This is sound money. Bitcoin is sound money. Bitcoin is digital gold. Bitcoin is the base layer rail for the future of finance. That is inevitable. And so, but we just got to get through this phase. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to get back to that, but I want to finish up like just some kind of price action talk yep. and before we move on to some of the regulatory stuff. Last thing I wanted to ask you on that front was, I think a lot of the Bitcoiners have been somewhat, I'll say disappointed in terms of Bitcoin's uh, behavior during this time of kind of geopolitical uncertainty, especially at the yeah. beginning of the year when people weren't sure if we were about to have like a full-fledged world war. Um, and I mean, it did serve as an inflation hedge throughout 2020, but as we've seen CPI come up at the end of the year and beginning of this year, um, it hasn't done so as, as well. So uh, at the same time, we've just basically seen it trading at like a really high correlation to the NASDAQ, it reached an all-time high correlation to the NASDAQ on the three-day and the one-week time frame in the last few yep. weeks to last month. So how do you kind of think through that correlation? And do you think just the, uh, I guess, th this correlation has just been like a lack of understanding of Bitcoin from the market? Or I guess, how do you think through that correlation? Uh, there's a bunch forward? of things here. So one, short-term correlation, meaningless. I mean daily, weekly, monthly, even yearly correlation numbers, they're just meaningless. They're not enough observations. You need thousands of observations to get real uh, data on, on correlation. So, so over the life of Bitcoin, it is 0.0, .0 correlated to bonds and 0 0.15 correlated to equities. Those are the numbers that matter. It is a diversifying asset. It is uncorrelated to the other assets. Now, what we know is that in periods of stress, all correlations go to one, right? Stocks and bonds are 70% correlated, except when they're not, except when they're perfectly correlated. International stocks and bonds, I mean, international stocks and domestic stocks are 70% correlated. No, no, I'm sorry. Stocks and bonds are 30% correlated, except when they're not, when they're perfectly correlated like now. International stocks and US stocks are 70% correlated, except when they're not, when things are going down. Hedge funds are 60% correlated, except when they're not. Hedge funds are doing worse than markets right now. Why? Debt, leverage, and liquidations. So all this talk about the short term, again, it's meaningless. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. The reason Bitcoin goes down in periods of stress is because of leverage. In leverage markets, and we had the highest leverage in history over the past two years, what ha happens is price starts to go down. And we saw this first time in March of 2020, right? They do the lockdowns, everybody freaks out, equity markets collapse, and gold, bonds, and Bitcoin all dropped like a rock. I mean, like correlations went to one, everything went down. Bitcoin went down more, went down 50%, even though the markets were only down 40%. It was like, what's going on? In a margin call, you don't get to sell what you want to sell. You sell what you have to sell. And the only thing you can sell and get value for 
cash, bonds, gold, Bitcoin. So you're, you're selling that as fast as you can to cover your margin calls. So that was the first problem. So then they pump up the stimulus and Bitcoin prices rise, stock prices rise. And says, see, they're correlating. No, 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 no. Stocks are following, okay? And in a short period of time, they look to be correlated, but it's the Bitcoin movement with the increase of money supply that was real. People say, well, what, what about when CPI came out at these high numbers and Bitcoin went down? Okay, two things. One, inflation is a lagging indicator. Bitcoin is priced real time every day, 24 seven. It already reflected the increase in money supply instantaneously. It took a year for oil prices to double and for car prices to go up that could be reflected in the CPI lag effect. And then the other problem is starting in November, the equity markets rolled over because why? The Fed signaled that they were going to take liquidity out of the system. So people start to puke and the assets that were over levered, Zoom, Peloton, you know, cloud companies, Shopify, I mean, they went down and they didn't go down 5% or 10%. They went down 70, 80, 90%. If you own something on leverage and you're down 80%, your toast, your history, it's gone, all of it, all your equity is gone. And so now you again have to sell. Then on top of that, we went from 10,000 to 70,000, which means what? Shit, I made a bunch of money. I got to pay taxes. So not shockingly, in February, Chinese New Year, every year we get a downward pressure on Bitcoin because the Chinese are selling. Oh, but China banned Bitcoin. No, they didn't. They own lots of it. And Chinese sell to pay out the cash for Lunar New Year. And then in April, everybody had to pay taxes. Okay, so they're selling pressure again. So that selling pressure co is correlated, quote unquote, and people look, oh, the correlation's rising because stocks are going down and Bitcoin's going down. But they're not going down for correlated reasons. They're going down for completely different reasons. Again, zoom out and the correlation numbers go back to where they are. And Ultimately, uh, money supply for the first time in 13 years over the last three months contracted. First time in 13 years. Okay. So Bitcoin, again, it's a real-time instrument. It's kind of telling us that. And gold prices are kind of telling us that. Gold prices haven't gone up either. And then when you look at the equity markets, the equity markets are having to digest the fact that they're still highly overvalued relative to future growth. GDP is collapsing. So GDP at first quarter was negative. GDP second quarter likely going to be close to zero, if not negative. And people are going to have this realization that, holy shit, earnings are not going to be as good as people thought. These levered equity positions are not going to look good. And so there is that potential for one more leg of deleveraging. And this is why I talk about this is just like 2001. 2000 was the tech bubble. But the crash wasn't in 2000. The market was only down 6% because everybody believed that the Fed was going to step in and save us, the Fed put. It wasn't until 2001 when all the fraud came out. Enron, WorldCom, all these bad companies had to admit, yeah, we were cooking the books. And so the market went down 13%. And then in 2022, the debt markets blew up post 9-11. And then we're down 22. Same thing's happening right now. All the fraud is coming to light. People are like, yeah, we kind of cheated on, on our performance numbers. And, and, and then Luna, you know, the fact that Luna and, and UST was called a stable coin is ridiculous. It, there's nothing stable about it. It should not have been allowed to be called a stable coin. It was a CDO, except faster and more dangerous. Right. It's like the Top Gun line. Right. We're going to teach you to fly the F-14 just faster and more dangerous. So that's that's what what the UST was. And the fact that someone exploited it and sent it to zero shouldn't surprise anybody because it wasn't defensible, just like, you know, CDOs went to zero. If you take garbage and you put it in a wrapper and call it AAA, it's still garbage. And 
I, I it, look, the bear market won't be over until Doge and Shiba are zero. That's the problem. We still have garbage that people think is real, and it's just not. Now, Bitcoin is not that. Bitcoin is real. Bitcoin is the future. Bitcoin is the rail for the future of finance um, and a perfect store of value and hard money. But there are going to be a lot more liquidations between now and the next spring. I yeah. think. I mean, you look at the top 10 and I don't want to name specific names, but you look at some of these projects and you're like, how are they still up there in the top 10? I mean, it's it's kind of unbelievable, especially some of these ones that have been in there for, for several years. One thing that you had uh, mentioned- Well, was come on, how can this guy be tweeting pictures that is mentally unstable? Who, well, one, who brought back the tracksuit? Tracksuits never looked good ever, not in the 70s, not in the 80s. Not in the 2000s. They don't look good now. And if you spend $3,500 on a tracksuit, you're just an idiot. Uh, and, and when you wear it in, as, as like a flex of a Ponzi scheme, it's like, what the hell? I, 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 I don't get it. I don't get it. And then you got, you got like I said, one of the top 10, there's no project. I and mean, there's, just, there's just no there there. And everybody's like, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's the future. I'm like, a future of what? I mean, it doesn't do anything. So... I, the thing I'm struggling with, in fact, the thing I'm going to talk about tomorrow in Texas is, are we in a single chain world like the internet? The internet, TCP IP is the base, FTP for files, HTTP for websites, SMTP for email, and www at the top. All of it's a single stack. It all rests on TCP IP, which you and I are using right now. In the future, in Web3, is it Bitcoin at the base layer, Filecoin on top of that, maybe Cosmos or Polkadot, and then Ethereum as the www dot as a toolkit to make apps? Maybe, maybe. Or does everything get built on top of Bitcoin? Do we have Lightning and then something else? And I don't know. Or do we have a multi-chain world, which is certainly possible, but it's the it's the sixty four trillion dollar question, and whoever answers that, I think is, is going to do do really really well. And it's the thing that that I think about a lot, and it's why I do believe that Paul Romer, who won the Nobel Prize four years ago for this, is right. It's not the best technology that wins; it's the technology that gets critical mass first, the law of increasing returns. And I think he's right. And for the same reason that that VHS beat Betamax, it's possible that Bitcoin, despite its flaws, the people say, is good enough and has enough network effect to distance itself from everything else, but it's not assured yet. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to start seeing DeFi on top of Bitcoin. How have you thought through some of these like interoperability projects? You've got several different ones, Layer Zero, Wormhole, Synapse, and, or any of those kind of catching your eye? Or I guess from a high level, how do you kind of think through the whole idea of interoperability? Look, I, th I think, I mean, Will, that, that, is, that is the great question. I mean, and, you know, one of the things about our business, right, it's, it's much more about knowing what questions to ask than having answers. So that question or the question of, are we going to live in a single you know, stack world or a multi-chain world? Those are the questions we have to ask. You know, the other one is, how do we interact with the chains, right? Just as individuals. I mean, are we going to do it with this? You know, I was I, at, I, at uh, Decentral, I watched a guy talk about, well, we have this, this chip that you implant in your eye. Like, Nope, hard pass. No chance. I'm doing that. I, I I don't care how cool you say it is. I don't care how. Now it would be awesome to not have to walk around with this thing. I I, I get it, but nope, not doing that. So I don't know, but something is going to help determine. Is there one L zero or are there multiple L zeros? Is Bitcoin an L zero? And then we need layer one, two, three. It's kind of like 
you know, Visa and MasterCard, right? They're money. They're not money. They're, they're a database. They're an L3. They sit on top of banks, which are an L2, which sits on top of Fedwire, which is now one. And then you got, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve is, is L0, is, is the money supply. But, you know, they're pretty valuable assets, even though they're L3s. So I, I can see that world, but I can also see a world, like you say, where we have multi-chains and interoperability across chains because there are different use cases. Gaming is a different use case than is a account. And you know, people say all the time that you know uh, uh, solutions for a problem, and there are no real problems. And I heard a guy go off the other day about you know putting more on the blockchain doesn't solve anything because you still have to have a legally forcible contract to kick the person out of their house that they default on the mortgage. Sure, but I can cut cost out of the system. I can make it permanent. I can get away, get rid of title insurance, which is just a waste of money. That's actually a good thing. It's accretive. And that money that gets repatriated can be spent on developing other new ideas. So, but I didn't answer your specific question. And that's why I say the question is more important than the answer is what do we think about interoperability? I think we're looking at it, we're investing in it. Um, and part of the job of a venture capitalist is to invest in lots of solutions, knowing, <clears throat> knowing that some of them will go to zero, but the power law will drive your returns. And so you know, we invest in 30 companies per fund, knowing that 10-ish, literally will go to zero. I would say, I wish I knew which 10 before I invested, but that's too hard. Um, and then of the 20, only four or five are gonna be the, the monster winners. But if we do our job right, those monster winners are so big that the return to the whole fund, you know, beats the average investor. I think one of the exciting things about crypto, I mean, obviously you've been in the space longer than me, so you could probably vouch for this more than myself, but it seems like no one really even knows what the next big thing will be. Like, for example, at the end of 2017, heading into 2018, I don't think many people really foresaw, you know, DeFi playing out. And then you had the massive DeFi summer yep. in 2020. So yep. I think with that being said, you know, maybe some of the things that get built out of this bear market, we don't even know what those things will be. And maybe to an extent, you know, you could, you could pick some strong conviction winners and some of those things, but at the same time, just kind of wait out and see which narratives emerge. Well, but that's, that's, that's part of the point, Will, is we don't know, and yet we do, right? We know that the ideas were good. They were early, and they fail, and then they get recrafted with new information and built for the future. So Netflix, Netflix version one, discs, literally discs in the mail that would break or get lost, almost went bankrupt. Netflix 2.0, which was video on demand, where it took four days to download a movie. Who would wait four days to download a movie? No one. So it did work, almost went bankrupt because we didn't have broadband yet. Once broadband came, now you could actually do this thing called streaming and Netflix has been pretty successful. So same thing with pets.com. Pets.com and Chewy.com are exactly the same company. You order pet stuff online and they bring it to your house. But back then we didn't have GPS delivery systems. We didn't have broadband. So everyone didn't have access to the internet to order this stuff from pets.com. And a poster child, Literally, the poster child for the failure of the internet. And Mark Andreessen said, said, all of these ideas are going to happen just over the next 20 years. And the same thing's true here. Those ideas that we had in 2018, many of them were spot on. They were just early. And one of the, you know, it's, it's like Ethereum. Ethereum has a lot of adoption. It has a lot of things being built on it. Problem is, the gas fees are just too high for lots of applications. So someone is going to come up with a better way. Now, I will argue that moving to proof of stake 
isn't the way, but other people seem to think that is the way. Uh, I think proof of work is, is superior, but that's just me. Um, but there are going to be innovations around failed ideas and failed companies that will people will look back and say, well, that's just that, but a little bit better and durable. And yeah, I got in this, this debate. You should never get in Twitter fights, but it's fun every now and then. And then I was ran against, you know, oh, Bitcoin, 13 years, no use cases, total failure. And he was like, you know, it's not, not like email. You know, email was an instant success. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? So email was invented in 1971. Okay. At 20 years of development, the first message was sent in 1971. It wasn't even called email. Uh, the term email wasn't even coined for another 10 years, 1980. And it was 1991 where the first uh, uh, broad base, broad scale usable network called Hotmail was invented. 20 years. And that doesn't include the first 20 years of development when it was kind of scientists sending stuff to each other. So don't tell me that email was an overnight success. Um, and the fact that you know we're still early in this development of the, the trust net, as I call it, the internet of value, um, it was just comical. And it, it, the other thing is like I said, email is like electricity, so valuable. Like, are you joking? It's not even close to electricity. Electricity, our whole life is about electricity, right? Electricity might be arguably the greatest invention because everything else is reliant on that. I mean, at, that just, this just blows me away. Think about in your wall is a socket that it doesn't leak out and go everywhere and you get lost. It, it just stays there until you plug something into it and you can turn on lights, make your computer work. It's really pretty amazing if you actually just stop and think about it. And we're allow, you know, it enables us to you know, refrigerate things so food can be stored and, and distributed. It allows us to make biotech medicines. It, it allow, enables all of this other stuff. Email allows me to get a bunch of spam every day. I mean, that's about it. I think it's safe to say in the same way that, you know, because Bitcoin has these 80, 85% drawdowns that consolidate such a large amount of supply into very convicted people allows it to move back up in the next bull run. From a technological standpoint, the fact that we have such uh, the strong aspect of like creative destruction allows the industry to continue growing at this exponential pace because no yep. one's coming to bail us out. You know, there's such these, these, these extreme aggressive drawdowns that cause all these bad ideas to get wiped out and then you build on top of that the new ones it's almost like the, the true version of what people think about with capitalism except we don't have that in traditional well, no, but that's what that too, exactly that's what winter is about winter is about death death is okay bad things should die part of the problem of of the u.s economy over the last 13 years is we didn't let the bad stuff die we gave everybody participation trophies any company could borrow money for free any bad idea could get funded by venture capital. Anything, I mean, that's just bad. That's dumb, right? Bad stuff is supposed to die. And winter is necessary for spring and summer and fall. Without it, you, you don't have balance in life. And so there are lots of projects that get backed that are just dumb. And I, it's, maybe it's unkind to say, but they're just dumb. And people who back them are going to lose a lot of money. And there are other projects that are really good. They're just early. doesn't mean they're dumb and still might lose money. And then there are other projects where you hit everything right. The timing's right. The idea is right. The people are right. And, and here's the other problem. As great as the talent migration into the space is, and it's the greatest talent migration I've ever seen, um, there aren't 10,000 great management teams, right? 1996 to 2000, there were 10,000 companies formed in the first tech bubble. And there weren't 10,000 good management teams. So 7,000 of them went to zero, literally 7,000 of them went to zero. And that should have been expected because it was mediocre management teams getting funding in, in time of free money. 
This time we got, you know, some say 10,000 token projects. There aren't 10,000 good entrepreneurs. There aren't 10,000. So 70, 80, I don't know, 90% of them likely go to zero. But the ones that survive and the ones that thrive and the ones that do attract great management teams are going to be off the charts successful, like, like beyond belief successful. And that's because of the exponential age, you know, as, as, as we move from an analog world where you and I meet physically to exchange a physical piece of paper for a physical stock certificate to the electronic age where we sit at our keyboard and trade QSIPs, but the physical paper sits in Dallas, Texas, to the digital world where there is no physical piece of paper anymore, where we trade in real time entries, tokens on a public ledger, which is superior. Digital assets, entries on a blockchain are superior to physical pieces of paper, full, full superior to Q, full stop, superior to title insurance, I mean, pieces of title, you know, a physical pink, pink slip, uh, uh, pink sheet. So pink slip. So it, it's, it's interesting though, the resistance from the incumbents to evolution, right? They don't want to go away. The banks don't want to go away. In the old days, if I want to send you money, I had to have a bank account, you had to have a bank account, and we would pay a fee, a wire fee, to, to make that trade. And then the money would sit for three days while it was held, okay? If I want to send you money today, we don't need a bank. I don't have to have a bank account. You don't have to have a bank account. We don't have to use the bank at all. We are unbanked, okay? Is that good, bad, or indifferent? I think it's good. Banks don't like it, but I think it's good. And there are 40% of the people in the world that don't have a bank account. So now they can get access to financial services through digital asset ecosystem. That's a good thing. It's good for humanity. So the incumbents, though, don't see it that way. They like being rentiers. They like making profits. By estimates, there are $7 trillion every year. Think about that number, $7 trillion of fees and expenses in the current financial system that could be eliminated if we went to a digital world. That's awesome. What could we do with $7 trillion? We can encourage a lot of innovation. We could solve food shortages. I mean, this is one of my personal pet peeves. How do we have a country where we spend 20 billion years, $20, $20 billion a year on weight loss and we have kids that go hungry, go to bed hungry at night? How's it possible? That, that, we clearly have enough calories because there's a lot of heavy people that are paying to lose weight. How can we have kids that don't have enough calories? Not logical. And so what can we do with $7 trillion? We do a lot of good. We can do a lot of good. And we will do a lot of good because that $7 trillion is coming. I think it's kind of like the Streisand effect as well. It's like when you see the IMF or you know large banks speaking out against Bitcoin or crypto broadly, I think for, for a lot of people, that makes them more intrigued about perhaps what they're trying to prevent people from looking at more than anything. Yeah, exactly. Look, I mean, it's Shakespeare right. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. So every time Janet Yellen says, oh, this is evil, or every time a bankster says it's a fraud, to your point, it's like, huh, well, why are they talking about it? I should look at it more. And once, here's the thing, every person I respect, every single one started skeptical, which is how you should, right? Because every custom begins with broken precedent from Will Durant. Every major advancement in the history of mankind starts with breaking precedent, breaking from what is customary believed to be true. That's what science actually is all about. It's about challenging the current thinking and making advancements and asking questions, right? The most important thing is not the answers. It's the questions. Can we ask the questions? Can we ask, why do we always do it that way? Why does it take three days to settle a stock trade? Why can they put a 14-day hold on my money at a bank? I thought it was my money. Oh, no, no, no. It's not your money. What do you mean it's not my money? Well, you have an IOU and I don't have to honor it. 99% of the time I honor it, but I don't have to. Oh, but I have insurance. Well, right. As long as you have less than 250K, you have insurance. Oh, and 
as long as less than 3% of all the banks go bust at the same time. Because if more than 3% go bust, then the FDIC runs out of money. So there's all these things that we accept to be true, but what we should really do is question them. And I think that's what good entrepreneurs do. I think that's why we are where we are. It's why you and I are talking. It's, be, it's why this amazing ass exists. Because you know Satoshi said, why is the chancellor bailing out the banks for the second time? Why do we have a global financial crisis? You know, it's not an accident that Satoshi's birthday is 4575. That is not accidental, right? 45, the day that uh, the gold was made illegal in 1933, and 1975 was the day it was made legal again, or the year it was made legal again. Now, this is cool too. Um, and I don't know if this is real, but it was pretty cool. Someone asked, you know, why are there 21 million Bitcoin? And this woman said, well, her daughter, 19 years old, has a theory that it was executive order 6108. No, let me get this right. Six, six, two, oh, one, six, two, oh, one, whatever, whatever it was, executive order, whatever, on February 5th, I mean, on April 5th, 1933, I guess six, must be six, Two oh one six two oh one. Um, if you do 21 with six zeros, you get 21 million. Oh, that's clever. That's now that's probably reading too much into it. It's like when people read Shakespeare and say, Oh, he was definitely thinking this. You're like, No, he was just drunk trying to make money, but okay, you can think he was thinking that. But um, so it probably isn't that, but I think that's pretty clever. So the executive order number is why we have 21 million instead of some other number. It's fun to like add special meanings to stuff, right? And make it a little yeah. more yeah. Um, cool. Hey, I know we're running late on time. Uh, I could talk to you for like three hours if we could, but. Well, we'll do it again. We'll do yeah, it again. Sure. Again, I appreciate you having me. We probably didn't cover half the things you want to because I always talk too much, but uh, really enjoy spending time together and, and we're overdue for lunch. So let's do it. Appreciate it, Mark. Yeah, for sure. And uh, enjoy your time at the conference. All right. Thanks, man. Talk Take to care. you soon.